the competition was as rigged as the 2020 election. Uh, I'm not getting into that tonight, all right? So, um, <clears throat> in all seriousness, um, and I, I trust and I hope that uh, this has been conveyed, um, especially the last uh, few weeks in Sunday school and uh, even in this morning, my heart is very, very heavy for young people. Um, I'm very burdened. It's hard, uh, it's difficult not to sometimes look at uh, just youth in society and just uh, feel very overwhelmed. Like, are they going to even have a chance? Um, parents have really dropped the ball. Um, a lot of kids that Brother Zach and I deal with on a weekly basis are not parented at all. That was probably one of the most startling things of getting in the public school system. And, and um, uh, Brother Zach was just relating to another uh, youth pastor this week that our first year of ministry in the public school, we worked with uh, three guys that were homeless and just stayed wherever uh, friends gave them a place to stay and bounced around from uh, spot to spot, and, and those who are, uh, who live in even uh, two-parent homes, um, they, they are not supervised, they're, they're not watched, they have absolute freedom uh, to go and do whatever they want, which let me just, if that sounds enticing to a young person in here tonight, let me say, that is, that is not true freedom, that's the absence of freedom. Being left to do whatever you want to do is not freedom. It's, it's, a, it's a hazard. Uh, it's a hindrance. It's a, it's a problem. And uh, so my heart is very, very heavy uh, for young people. And uh, so in that sense, it was a privilege to be involved in uh, camp this week and try to keep the focus on the preaching and, um, you know, have a good time. Uh, camp's going to be fun, just about anything you do, uh, but what really matters is, is that preaching, and uh, because it is the only hope for young people, to hear truth from God's Word that can shape the parameters of their thinking, and my thinking, and even the counselor said that parameters were established in all of our thinking this week by the preaching of the truth of God's Word. And that's, that's the only hope for life, is that we, uh, we make sure that our, our life is on a biblical path. And there's uh, some other youth camps that I've been asked to preach uh, this summer. And uh, so I uh, have already been in a lot of prayer just seeking the Lord about what to communicate and know, kind of knowing that coming into the summer that there was going to be opportunity um, with young people. I just kind of asked the Lord to put on my heart, uh, maybe not necessarily, uh, I knew the messages would come in their proper time, but is there some overall things that you, that you want to put on my heart that are fundamental to communicate to young people that they really know? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a little bit about what God's put on my heart as far as a burden for young people today. So... Um, I'm going to preach to young people tonight. Here's, here's my category for young people tonight. Uh, two to 102, okay? So if you're in that age range, I'm considering you a young person tonight, and I need you to listen up to what's on the heart of your pastor tonight. Um, if I was in my home church, I'd have to broaden that range because there is a man that attends every service who's 104 now. So uh, it is possible uh, but I don't think we have anybody that old in here. But basically what I'm saying is this is for everybody. But I do hope that young people um, will listen up because these truths are so fundamental um, that the younger that a person grabs hold of them and accepts them, believes them, and bases their life on them, the better their life can be. 
And so here they are. I'm going to give you the four. Uh, I'm going to give you four uh, fundamental truths, and then we're going to go to scripture and we're going to talk about them. The first thing is this: God is real, and He is really God. That's the first one. God is real, and He is really God. And talk about what the, we'll talk about what what I mean by that in just a moment. The second one is this. You often, and I emphasize the word often, you often do not know as much about life as you might think you do. I think that's a fundamental truth that all of us young people need to grab hold of, that we often don't know as much about life as we think we do. Uh, The third thing is this, that God wants to be involved in every aspect of our life. If we're not careful, we can make separation between the sacred part of our life and the secular part of our life. And that kind of fits into James saying a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I think that's why a lot of people see a lot of hypocrisy in Christianity Because God's not allowed to be involved in every aspect of our life. But God wants to be involved in every aspect of our life. And then the last thing is this. God does not play games with us. He has a plan. And he wants us to know his plan. Uh, there's, There's far too many people that think that God's just toying with them. Or something like that. God, God doesn't play games with us. He, he has a plan for our life and he wants us to know that plan. And those are four things that God just put on my heart that I, I wish every young person could really grab hold of. I'm going to ask you to turn with me tonight to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> and we're going to look at a couple of verses here of what God says. Proverbs chapter 3 verse Uh, One is where we're going to begin. Proverbs 3, verse 1. He says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths." Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak to us tonight, and Lord, help us to see from your word these fundamental truths, and help all of us who all have, by your grace, and if you're willing, hours and days ahead of us to live in this life. God, would you just help us to make sure that these fundamental truths are accepted and applied as they should be. Um, so that our life could be just exactly what you would have it to be. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, it is on my heart to communicate to young people that starting at a very young age, God wants them to live according to what I have called original purpose. That when God created humanity, he had an original purpose for man in a way that that purpose was to be accomplished. And God doesn't change. He never changes. He's immutable. And God wants man to, uh, to be uh, in fulfillment of that original purpose. As a matter of fact, that is the very reason why Christ died on the cross, was to reconcile us back to God so that once again in Christ we can fulfill that original purpose. And, and that, that, that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, but I, I want to look at these four truths tonight. And the first one being that God is real and he is really God. Preacher, what do you mean by that? I mean we live in a society today that from an early age causes young people to question the very existence of God. 
That has not always been the case in the United States of America. As a matter of fact, since the, this country's founding, God has been included in so much of its history. Um, there's, there's scoffers and arguments made today that the early fathers were, were atheists and were godless men, and that, that's just an intentional blindness to, to historical documents and truths that are packed full of references to a creator God and how much he was referenced so often in things. But we, our country has slid so far from its original foundation that, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not even sure that it's a majority, but it's a very loud minority that is constantly bringing about changes in our country that are designed to remove the existence from God from anything and everything. There's constant legislation uh, before legislators to remove the words under God out of the pledge and to take in God we trust off of our currency and, and, and things like that. And the fact of the matter is, there, in the direction our country is headed, there is a day, I believe, that those words will disappear from both the pledge and the currency, and I'm not exactly upset that that happens because at such a time, are we really under the protection of God anymore? And in God, do we actually trust anymore? So maybe they need to be removed because they're not so. And, and that would be the greatest tragedy of all, is for them to, remove, to be removed because they were not so. But God is still a real God. And he is still God. God is real and he is really God, which means that not only does God exist, but he exists in a way that he is sovereign over all things. There is nothing that takes God by surprise. There is nothing that catches God off guard. There, there are young people today that are asking some of the heaviest questions that I've heard from anybody, young person or adult, because of things that they are made to question by things that they are taught. And some question the existence of God because of the existence of evil. So, Pastor, if, if God is God and he's over all things, then... then does, then, then why does evil exist? Why did God create evil? And the, the simple understanding of that from a biblical perspective is that God is sovereign over all things, but God did not create evil. Evil is not a creation of God. God created mankind with dominion, meaning with free choice, and mankind allowed evil into God's creation by man's own choice. That wasn't part of God's plan. When God got finished creating everything that he made, he said, it's very good because there was no evil in what God made uh, in this material world at that time. But, but, but understand that God's not the creator of evil and just because evil exists doesn't mean God's not sovereign. It, evil will be answered for because there is a sovereign God who is over all things. And I want every one of us to understand and not to question, God definitely exists and he is really God. He is really over all things. He's got a plan and his plan cannot be frustrated. It cannot be deterred. His plan will work out because he's God. Well, where do we see that in this passage? Well, how about this right here? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. You know what that verse says to me? That, that part of the verse, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. It says that there is a God, that God is real, and he is really God. If he's really God, I can trust him. If he's really over all things, then I can trust that he is a good God. I can, I, 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 I can trust that he, he looks out for me, that, that he, uh, if we fast forwarded to Jeremiah in chapter 29, that his thoughts toward me are thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring me to an expected end. I, I, want, I, I want young people to understand, so I'm talking to you tonight. I want you young people to understand that you can trust God. 
If God's not real, what are we doing here? If God's not real, we're wasting our time. If God's not real, then everything just, just happens and then it's over and it's done with. And you need to understand that the whole proposition of evolution is to remove God out of the equation. But the problem is, if you remove God out of the equation, by Him all things consist. So if God is taken out of the equation, there's nothing that is holding anything together. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the true and living God. He is, God is real, and He is really God. And what that means is he's over all things, meaning that we can trust him. And we should trust him with all our heart. The heart is the seat of affection and emotion. The heart is the, the central part of our being as it's referred to so often in the Bible. And it's our heart that God wants wholly focused upon Him, wholly trusting in Him from the most central part of our being. God says, trust me. Trust me does not mean that He will cause you to understand everything. As a matter of fact, Understanding everything kind of negates the idea of trust. Trust occurs when we don't understand. Trust occurs when we have questions. Do you know, I want young people to know that it's okay to have questions. I want young people to know it's okay to ask questions. I want young people to know that they're not, they're, they're not alone in the fact that as you go through life and as you live life, that, that questions are going to arise in the heart and mind about this God. But what I also want them to understand is that God is not, square, God is not scared of their questions. That, that God is not, uh, God's not sitting up in heaven going, man, I hope they don't ask that. Because I want young people to know that God has answers to any questions that the heart or mind can ever come up with. That, that God's, not, God's not afraid of somebody coming to him and saying, God, here's something I really want to know. God, here's something my soul is longing to find out about. I'm telling you, if you read your Bible, you'll find over in the book of Acts a man named Cornelius who had some questions, and he didn't have understanding. He didn't know, but he came, to, he came to a God that he had heard about and said, God, I just simply want to know you. I simply want to understand. You know what God did? God, had a, God woke a man up out of a nap to go on a journey to come to his house and answer the questions of his heart. And that same God today can answer your questions if you'll take your questions to Him. You might be surprised about this, but I'm telling you the truth. God has more answers than Google. That's a fact. I don't care how extensive Google is. I don't, I don't care if you can type two letters and Google knows what you're thinking before you type anymore. I don't care how smart Google seems. God has more answers and better answers than the Internet does. There's so many people that turn to the Internet like it's God. Like the Internet knows everything. The Internet only knows what man's mind and man's imagination puts into it. That's a long way from a true and living God. And God's not concerned about you bringing your questions to Him. One of my favorite passages about that is this. It's in James chapter 1, if any man lack wisdom. You know what that means? If you're going through a trial and you don't understand something... And you need answers. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally 
and upbraideth not. What does that mean, upbraideth not, preacher? It means he doesn't rebuke people for asking him questions. He doesn't rebuke people for saying, I don't understand. If God rebuked people who questioned him, then he would have had to rebuke his own son who cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But the truth is, God's got answers. And you know why he's got answers? Because he's God. And do you know why he can give you those answers? Because he's real. God is real. And he's really God. And we ought to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Number two, young people, are you listening? And don't look around at the teenagers. I'm talking to all of you. Remember who I'm qualifying as a young person tonight. You often don't know as much about life as you think you do. Here's what he says. And lean not unto thine own understanding. He doesn't, t- he doesn't say there uh, until you grow up and figure everything out. <laughs> because the truth is we don't have everything figured out. And we're not going to have everything figured out. And the moment we start leaning to our own understanding is the moment we are going to falter and fall. I've said this many times and I'll say it again tonight. One of the scariest verses in the Bible that scares me every time I read it is this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It is a scary notion to think that I could, get, I could get so full of myself that I think I have so much clarity and so much understanding all of a sudden in a certain area that I've got it all figured out and I know exactly the direction to go. That's foolish. We often know less about life than we think we do. Sometimes we think we get things figured out only to find out there was some crucial piece that we didn't have. We're all growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and there's not a person that's arrived yet. So we cannot, we cannot, we must not lean unto our own understanding. We've got to keep our eyes on the Lord. We've got to say, God, I need need your vision. I can't trust my own. God, I get distracted. God, I get pulled aside. God, I sometimes think I know the right way and what's right, but often often I find out only too late that I didn't understand as much as I thought I did. And I'm telling you, I think a lot of adults in here will agree with me tonight. There's few people worse about this than young people. Have y'all ever met that teenager that just knew everything? You know, you, you try to give them a, a little bit of encouragement in a particular direction, they don't need your encouragement. They got it all figured out. They know. You try to warn them a little bit about their attitude, and they don't need your warning about their attitude. They, they've got it all figured out. You try to help them to realize, now wait a minute, um, you really haven't known her long enough to commit yourself to a lifetime of relationship. But they already know that that's the one and you can't tell them any different. You don't have to amen me for me to know I'm preaching truth tonight. But I am. it, it, It is very common for young people to think, I have so much clarity about things right now. And they don't even know about the set of blinders that are on their eyes because they're leaning to their own understanding. Third thing, God wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. Here's what Solomon said. He said, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. Can I ask you something tonight? How could we go wrong by doing this? How could we go wrong by acknowledging God in every aspect of our life? 
bringing him in on every decision that we make in life. I'm talking about from the seemingly mundane decisions that we make moment by moment throughout our days to the major life-changing, life-altering decisions that we make. How can we go wrong by bringing God into every one of those decisions and acknowledging God has a say here? God wants, God wants his voice to be heard. In this matter, God wants to have influence in this. Man, I, uh, I never thought, I, I never, I'm not a prophet obviously, but I never foresaw the day that I would hear a term like influencer and know what it was. If you don't, I'm going to erode your innocence a little bit here. An influencer is somebody that gets on social media and does stuff to influence other people to do the same. Now, a lot of it has to do with monetization of videos and getting as many likes and subscribes and followers as they possibly can. But some of them don't care a thing about the money. They just like the attention. And they like to call themselves an influencer. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't mind telling you, as a pastor, I'm called to be an influencer. Not on YouTube. Not on TikTok. But that, that's part of my calling but really, it's not me that's the influencer. Do you realize that the only influencer we need in our lives is God himself? And God ought to be allowed to influence every decision we make. Which is why Solomon told his son, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. In all thy ways, get his influence. Take in his influence. Let him be your guide. Let his character influence your character. Let his decisions influence your decisions. We, we ought to be daily before the throne saying, Lord, teach me thy ways. There ought to be a desire in every one of us to want to be like Jesus Christ in everything we do. And let that be carried to every aspect of our life. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And here's the last, th last thing. God's not playing games with us. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan. And he wants us to know it. I, I, I know, I, number one, I, I was there. I've been there. And, and I've also counseled with young people along the way that are, you know, they're getting to the place where they're about to get uh, out of high school or leave the home or go to college or something like that and all of a sudden they f they're facing these decisions and may maybe they grew up in a godly home where decisions were made for them. There's nothing wrong with that. But there does come a day with every person that they've got to be responsible to make their own decisions. And I know it was for me. It can be an overwhelming thing. I've told you this before but I, I remember... Uh, I remember my dad dropping me off at college and driving back to Kentucky and I, uh, leaving me with a, a calling card. <laughs> That'll tell you a little bit about how old I am. Anybody remember calling cards? And he, he left me with a stack of calling cards, said, call anytime you need me. And uh, I don't think he had in mind what I had in mind because I called all the time. And one night I called him, I said, Dad, I'm needing a couple things from Walmart, and there's some guys from the dorm that are going up there. Can I go with them? He said, son, let's talk. <laughs> he said, this, this isn't going to work. You're there, I'm here. Every, you know, every time you need deodorant, you don't have to call me <laughs> and ask if you can ride with somebody to Walmart to get it. Son, just make a decision, go get your deodorant. My dad did say this, though. Because you can't get the dad out of somebody. Who are you going with? <laughs> and then he caught himself and said, now you just got to make sure as you're making those decisions that you're going with responsible people 
and you don't get yourself in a compromising situation by going with the wrong people who are going to do things that you didn't even expect they were going to do. So, so uh, he said, look, you know, just taught me a little bit. Look out for some things like that. But I can remember freshmen in, in college just kind of being overwhelmed with like, okay, so all of these decisions now are mine. This has not been how it has been heretofore. But it's how it is hereafter. And that was long before the, the realization of getting married and having a family and now having, having the fate of others rest upon my decisions as well. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. I, I remember in some of those days it was like, God, I just can't see your plan God, I, I, I want to know where I'm going here, but I, 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 don't, I don't see where you're leading. God, I, I knew when I was 12 years old and you called me to preach and I, I surrendered to that, but God, I, now I'm already coming all the way through a college and, and I don't know for sure that you want me to be a missionary. I don't know for sure that you want me to be a Bible translator. I don't know for sure that you want me to be an evangelist or somewhere else in ministry. And, and I'm just looking and I'm just going, God, it seems like so many others around me are making decisions and they have their path laid out and they know where they're going and God, I, I don't know that. And there was times I was tempted to think that God, you're just, are you just playing a game with me? God, what am I missing here? Fortunately, I had a very good influencer in my life and an assistant pastor here in the church who just constantly encouraged me that until, we're, until God shows you where he wants you next, just be faithful right where you are. You just keep doing what God's already showed you until God shows you that he wants you to do something else. And do you know what? Along the way, in God's time, he showed me in undeniable ways, just as clearly as could be, just exactly where his path was leading me. I, I, I'm even embarrassed about this now, but going through the first couple of years at college, I was kind of interested in that girl, and you know, we would talk, and we'd be friends and things like that, and then that didn't work out, and, and then I'd, I was interested in another girl, and and we would talk and things like that. And then I'd come out of the dorm and she'd be getting in some other guy's car and I'd realize that was over. And then, then I'd be interested in this girl right over here. And though I never officially dated anyone, my affections were here and then my affections were here and then my affections were here. And I, I remember uh, on a summer where I was living in the apartment in this house next door to the church and I was interning here doing children's summer ministries right here at South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church and I, I was emailing a girl that had, that had uh, gone home for the summer and I just remember thinking, this is stupid. This is dumb. I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm just, I'm tired of this. I hate giving my affection to some girl but being too scared to actually tell her that I had affection for her and then just kind of seeing where things went and then watching them crumble and fall apart and then I'm like, well, I'm kind of hurt by that but it's my fault. I never really did anything about it and then uh, who's next? I'm just sick of that. Stupid. Stupid. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. So I stopped emailing that girl, and every time I was tempted to look at a girl and think, I wonder if she's it. I just remembered how stupid I felt over and over again and thought, that can't be how this works. God, God's, God surely doesn't direct us to go through this. And so every time, and I'm not even saying there was a lot of opportunities, but every, every time I'd be tempted in that, I'd just say, I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing that again. Later on that summer, I 
went home for just a short time and I knew I wasn't going to be able to spend much time at home or with my dad and it just so happened my dad was heading off to preach a youth camp. So I said, all right, I'll go with dad to that youth camp. I'll hang out with dad. And at that youth camp, I met a girl that, there was, that I at the time had no romantic interest in whatsoever but this girl stood out because in almost an instant, we already knew each other before the youth camp a little bit, but at that youth camp, it was just like, man, this girl could possibly be the best friend I've ever had in my life. Without any kind of romantic intentions or desire, it was just, she was cool. <laughs> and later I met Alyssa. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I... I <laughs> No, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons there was no romantic intentions was because she had a boyfriend at the time. Because she couldn't wait on God either. <laughs> and I, <clears throat> but then, without that pressure, we just got to be friends. Just really enjoyed being friends with each other. And then I remember the moment of the day when God made it clear to me, that's her. You've been looking for my direction and haven't been running around trying every path that's out there. You just decided to wait on me. Okay, well, now I'm telling you, that's the direction. And I'm telling you, I'm glad I got the best wife a man could have. I'm not trying to insult any women in here tonight. But that's just the way I feel about it. I got the best wife that God could ever give me. She's a blessing to my soul. And I'm glad I waited on the Lord. I'm glad I realized that he shall direct my path. We get married. God directed our path with children. God directed our path in ministry without having to get all worked up and antsy and just, ah! Some of you know what I'm talking about, don't you? But just when you put them all together, it just comes out as this solid unit. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And I'm just going to tell you as I'm telling young people, what a sweet way to live. It works. It's a great way to go through life, just depending upon God and trusting. God's got a plan for me, and when he's ready to move me, he's going to show me. He's not trying to hide from me. He's not trying to keep it from me. No, he'll show me in his time. I'm just going to trust him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. I pray that you would...